There are, of course, great dangers to this, as to every kind of freedom, but the great promise of it is that, traveling, we are born again, and able to return at moments to a younger and a more open kind to self. Traveling is a way to reverse time to a small extent and make a day last a year or at least 45 hours. And traveling is an easy way of surrounding ourselves, as in childhood, with what we cannot understand. Language facilitates in cracking this cracking open, for when we go to France, we often migrate to French and the more childlike self, simple and polite, that speaking a foreign, foreign language adduces. Even when I'm not speaking pidgin, English in Hanoi, I'm simplified in a positive way and concern not with expressing myself, but simply making sense. So, travel for many of us is a quest for not just the unknown, but the unknowing. I, at least, travel in search of an innocent I that can return me to a more innocent self. I tend to believe more abroad than I do at home, which, though treacherous, 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 which, though treacherous, again, can at least help me to extend my vision, and I tend to be more easily excited abroad and even kinder. And since no one I meet can place me, no one can fix me in my resume. I have no idea what this word is. I can remake myself for better, as well as, of course, for worse. If travel is notoriously a cradle for false identities, it can also, at its best, be a crucible for truer ones. In this way, travel can be a kind of monetism on the move. On the road, we often live more simple, even when we're staying in a luxury hotel with no more possessions than we can carry, and surrounding, so, surrendering, surrendering, and surrendering ourselves to chance. This is what Camus meant when he said that what gives value to travel is fear, disruption in other words, or emancipation from circumstance, and all the habits behind which we hide. And that is why many of us travel not, not in search of answers, but of better questions. I, like many people, tend to ask questions of the places I visit and relish, relish most the ones that ask the most searching questions back, back of me. In Paraguay, for example, where one car in every two is stolen, and two-thirds of the goods on say are smuggled, I have to rethink my every Californian assumption. And in Thailand, where many young women give up their bodies in order to protect their families to become better Buddhists, I have to question my own too-ready judgments. The ideal travel book, travel, no, the, the ideal travel book Christopher, Christopher Isherwood once said, should be perhaps a little like a crime story in which you're in the search are of something. And it's the best kind of something, I would add, if it's one that you can never quite find. I remember, in fact, after my first trips to Southeast Asia, more than a decade ago, how I would come back to my apartment in New York and lie in my bed, kept up by something more than jet lag, playing back in my memory over and over 
all that I had experienced, experienced and paging wistfully, th though my photographs and reading and rereading my diaries as if to extract some memory, some mystery from them. Anyone witnessing this strange scene would have drawn the line, the right conclusion. I was in love. For if every true love affair can feel like a journey to a foreign, foreign, <laughs> foreign, <laughs> foreign country where you can't quite speak the language and you don't know where you're going and you're pulled ever deeper into the invitation, inv inviting darkness, every trip to a foreign country can be a love affair where you're left puzzling over who you are and whom you've fallen in love with. All the great travel books are love stories by some reckoning from the Odyssey and the Aeni to the Divine Comedy and the New Testament. And all good trips are, like love, about being carried out of yourself and the deposit, deposited in the mites of terror and wonder. <laughs> <laughs> 